Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye, aye, Captain! Oh! Are you ready, kids? I said, are you ready? He lives in a pineapple under the sea. SpongeBob! SquarePants! A turban and yellow and porous is he. SpongeBob! SquarePants! If not a cool nonsense, be something you wish. SpongeBob! SquarePants! Then drop on my deck and flop like a fish. SpongeBob! SquarePants! SpongeBob! SquarePants! SpongeBob! SquarePants! SpongeBob! SquarePants! SpongeBob! SquarePants! And now, a special report! In July of 1999, the world was first introduced to SpongeBob SquarePants. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. At first considered too bizarre for mainstream success, it has become one of the most popular television shows in history. Join us as we discover how this little yellow sponge became a worldwide phenomenon. It's not only a program, it's become a lifestyle for a lot of people. I don't think we can possibly overestimate how much this has penetrated American culture. SpongeBob is the coolest thing on the planet. So how many times you watch a cartoon, you get a big belly laughs, and you feel good about it? I mean, I like the fact that he's yellow. I like the fact that he's porous. I'm hydrodynamically designed. I like the fact that he wears pants. You can be any age, any race, any type of person, and you can relate to this character. <laughs> Dude, you have split my sides. It was as though the territory that had been once dominated by Mickey Mouse was now being rehabilitated by SpongeBob SquarePants. The central character is a sponge with distinctive taste in trousers. He's the top show on a top cable channel running several times a day. In animation, there are just so many hurdles, so many obstacles, so many difficult challenges. How do you know that your audience is going to take to a, a sponge character? I mean, wow, that's, that's quite a leap. My name's Steve Hillenberg, and I'm the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants. I've always been fascinated with the ocean. It's just a, a place that is unlike anywhere on the planet, and there's unexplored areas and animals and plants that we don't even know about still. I stepped on one of these once. I think my interest in the ocean started with those documentaries that Jacques Cousteau did. It was like looking at another planet. Once more, I drift downward for the blue spaces of the sea. I ended up getting a job right there, teaching marine biology, my dream job. Also, I was kind of like the staff artist. I was drawing a comic book about tide pool animals. It was in that comic that I drew the first sponge named Bob, which eventually would become SpongeBob. I decided I wanted to do a show about one character that was innocent, well-meaning, and kind of an oddball. Especially at the time SpongeBob came out, there were a lot of shows that were sarcastic, they had characters who were almost like little adults. There's no question that, you know, when you look at the 90s, the things that were connecting were the South Parks and, uh, and the Ren and Stippy, and that was great, and it is what made SpongeBob so distinctively different. I think SpongeBob was an attempt instead to make a character who's genuine and earnest. I think that's something people really connected with. There is an innocence, a, a naivete, and a sincerity to it that you get practically no place else on the television dial. 
His name is SpongeBob SquarePants, and his friend's name is Patrick. Mr. Krabs is really cheap, but SpongeBob doesn't care because he just likes being a fry cook and making Krabby so, Patties. So, 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 bottom line, he's a sponge. <laughs> they said, we've got it, we've got it. And they said, what do you got? And they said, we have something yellow and square. It's a sponge, you're gonna love it. And I was like, okay. I'm not sure there was a lot of confidence in the idea that it was gonna go anywhere. How do I make the biggest show in the world? You know, I think if you try to synthesize that, then there's no way that you can succeed at it. I had no idea what was going on with this cartoon. I just thought it was just some inane pulp for preschoolers. That's the lamest idea I have ever heard. When I heard the initial concept for it, I said, those guys must be crazy. <gasps> Take that back. SpongeBob SquarePants? That just sounds weird. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of money riding on this, and a lot of people, jobs, all involved with this kind of thing. I just wanted it to be funny, and I didn't want to be embarrassed for anything that I made. There's a lot of executives that would have taken one look at that and said, you've got to be kidding. You're going to put this hallucination on our air? No. Ultimately, it's the audience that decides. They are the ones that have the final say in the success and failure of what we do. The audience is the ultimate jury on any show. There's a lot of cartoonists who have ideas for cartoon shows. Nickelodeon, as, as daring as they are with the kind of shows they do, you know, each one is a risk. Ah, the sea, so fascinating, so wonderful. Here we see Bikini Bottom teeming with life, home of one of my favorite creatures, SpongeBob SquarePants. Yes, of course he lives in a pineapple, you silly. There's no science to funny. The things that uh, strike you as funny, they either strike you as funny or they don't. Let's face it, this is one weird puppy of a TV show. These characters are strange, they behave in really strange ways. Things that look like snails, meow like cats. It was so different, we just didn't quite know what to expect. But when we viewed the pilot, I mean, it was nonstop laughter. looking at each other and going, is anybody gonna get this but us? I mean, is this just entertaining to us? Or, or you know, I, I don't know, we'll see. We have an excellent SpongeBob, I can't even say it, I don't know if Mark can, SquarePants, SpongeBob, you know, the cartoon guy. It took a couple of seasons. We were just going about our business, making a show that we thought was hilarious. For the first year or two or three, he was kind of quietly on the network, gaining, building his audience. It wasn't in the papers. I don't remember anybody making a big deal about it. Anytime a family with kids came over, I'd say, I've got someone I want you to watch. And everyone loved it. I thought, oh, man, please, someone recognize this besides me. We're doing jokes where, you know, they're so surreal, and you're thinking, no one's going to get this. But I guess more people than you would think got it. SpongeBob SquarePants. That's it? Get it together. Get it, He's get the greatest his buddy Squidward. Yes. A little yellow sponge who's making a big splash. I mean, it is the biggest, most powerful argument for just being open to where your, your passions bring you. And, you know, look, look where they brought Steve. Steve's passions were animation and the ocean. He called me to come over to his place and he showed me what he had. Drawings, watercolor treatments of SpongeBob's pineapple house and uh, Squidward's big Easter Island tiki head house and the Krusty Krab lobster trap. I just fell in love with the characters, the visuals, the relationships between the characters, and I just wanted to be in on it so bad. Steve and I started on Rocco's Modern Life. That's where I met Steve. 
We had sort of a meeting of the minds as far as comedy, what we thought was funny. There were a lot of ideas Steve wanted to do on Rocco that we eventually got to do on SpongeBob, um, like the live action cutaways. And the only way out is through the perfume department. It was sort of like, well, if any of us gets our own show, we're gonna do all that stuff. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I always hate going in there. Yeah. There was a conscious effort to emulate what we grew up on. We all wanted to do that kind of cartoon. SpongeBob is a really well-crafted show, and part of that is the use of squash and stretch. You know, pulling and squeezing. They can flatten him like a pancake. They can do anything with him. I'm absorbing his blows like I was made of some kind of spongy material. It's incredibly funny. And there's just fantastic writing and great storyboarding. You know, these are the elements of classic animation. We love Bugs Bunny and we talked about these things. Wasn't that awesome the way this worked and this happened? And we used to talk it out for hours and hours. That kind of thing goes back to the old classic movie cartoons and the theatrical cartoons and the Bugs Bunnies, the things that were done in the 40s and 50s that haven't been done in decades. We're trying to stay true to that, what we loved about cartoons when we were young. I'm sorry, Mr. Krabs. Uh, could you run that by me again? Sure. I said I'm worried that... That's what I thought you said. Now let me offer this as a rebuttal. Ah! Donna! What? What do you want? Can't you see I'm busy? I'm busy, I tell you. I'm busy! <laughs> you know, Mark Twain said, make your vocation a vacation. <laughs> Animation's a lot of work, so I definitely felt like, hey, we're going to be here every day. We might as well be enjoying it. F is for friends who do stuff together. U is for you and me. N is for anywhere and anytime at all. Down here in the deep blue sea. There was a sign on my door that said, have fun or you're fired. And I think, in a way, it's true. <laughs> It was a joke, but, you know. F is for fire that burns down the whole town. Use for uranium bombs. N is for no survivors when you're... Langton, those things aren't what fun is all about. Well, if you take your leg and you stick it in the air. We just thought it would be fun to take a day to the aquarium in Long Beach, maybe getting some ideas and see some of the things that people were drawing every day. Squidward's his name, but he's an octopus. I like the round head, but Squidward is funnier than Octo Boy. Steve's a great collaborator, and he was real open to our ideas, and everyone was just really excited to be making a show that was so different. He puts a, a, a farmer's hat and starts milking the, the little jellyfish. The clarinet on fire, and they're doing this like tribal dance around it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most brilliant things Steve did on the show is choosing the group that's on the show. It is kind of like a relay race, you know? We have writers and then they hand their thing off to the storyboard artists. We take what's written here and we think of jokes that maybe you couldn't explain in writing. That gets handed off to the cast and then that gets handed off to the animators. One episode includes about 20,000 drawings. You have to do it all by hand. The single goal that everyone who works on the show has in mind is just bringing all they can to their little piece of the pie. Along the way, it's snowballing, you know, picking up everyone's input along the way. And I feel very lucky because I feel like everyone really just is focused on how do we make this the best SpongeBob cartoon that we can. Meow. Okay, places, everybody. Squidward, are our heroes ready? Has there ever been? Start the movie. Yeah! Harder still! You heard the little yellow square guy? Yeah! 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 <laughs> Very good. Stand by for pickups on that. My name is Andrea Romano. 
and I'm the voice director for SpongeBob SquarePants. Cartoons are made by recording a vocal track first. The animation comes afterwards. Somebody has to tell the actors what's going on, how loud they need to be, what does that oof stand for. The characters are the most important part of the show. As crazy as they are, you would like to be their friend too. The great thing is, is that we were given such a wonderful set of characters. They're an ensemble that, that you can just milk endlessly. I'm Carolyn Lawrence, and I play Sandy Cheeks on SpongeBob SquarePants. Sandy is a squirrel. She's a land squirrel, but she's living in the ocean as a scientist. She's very bright. She's very motivated, as squirrels are. She likes to do karate. My name is Bill Fagerbaki. I am the voice of Patrick Starr. I think Bill is the smartest dumb guy ever. What do you mean? He plays a dumb guy so well. Now put it on the lid. No, the lid. 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 Almost there. Now head for the lid. Cold, warmer, warmer, warmer. You're hot, you're on fire! Oh, it burns! Okay, okay, wait, wait. He's the only person I've seen in fiction or documentary that I feel smarter than. You know, the world thinks Patrick, you know, has nothing going on upstairs and that he's a doofus. SpongeBob doesn't put down Patrick. He thinks Patrick's a pretty smart, happening guy. My name is Clancy Brown, and I play Mr. Krabs on Good Days. If I could be any character on the show, it'd be, it'd be uh, Mr. Krabs. Look at all this cash! Hey, look at all this money! I hope me I can take it. Where? I'm all right, sonny. He got all the money. He always want more. <laughs> Let's see. A five-letter word for happiness. Money. It's all about me money. Money, 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 money. Mr. Krabs, can I have a raise? No. And I'll live it for me. I always say Squidward is me in a comic sense. I'm not that sarcastic. Oh, really? Squidward had a Krabby Patty. <sighs> Welcome to the Krusty Krab, where it's almost as if the evolutionary clock ticks backward. His laugh, oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> well, Squidward is mostly grumpy because SpongeBob is always bothering him. Living between Patrick and SpongeBob, Squidward is the recipient of all the craziness, and he's the one that gets hurt and knocked down and humiliated in the end. Ah! Ow. My name is Mr. Lawrence. I uh, play Plankton on SpongeBob. SpongeBob, you will be mine. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite character is Plankton. Plankton. Plankton, of course. This little tiny character, but he's got this big voice. I win! He has one goal in his life. He really wants it to make a Krabby Patty. It's destroying him. <laughs> All hail Plankton! All hail Plankton! Oh, oh, I'm ready. Oh, oh, promotion. Oh, oh, I'm ready. Oh, oh, promotion. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, I think I stepped in something. As soon as people found out I was working on it, they all went so crazy. Actors asking me, please, can you find something for me on SpongeBob? I'll come in and play a fish who just goes, mm, because they want to be a part of it. They want to be able to say to their kid there was a part of it. A grown man came up to me, oh, you're so famous. And I said, well, happy days, you know. He said, no. He said, you're SpongeBob SquarePants grandma. Come here, give your granny her kissy kissy. My name is Tim Conway. It used to be uh, Betty, 
but I had to change it, you know, to, uh, in the business and everything. Will you stop calling me boy? My granddaughter said, you know, have you seen SpongeBob? And I said, I don't think so. And she said, you know, you're on it. So I tuned in and by golly, she was right. Time to come out of retirement. There's evil afoot. Evil. There it is. <laughs> I've had older people come up, old men. Are you Mermaid Man? You're Mermaid Man? I said, I'm Mermaid Man. Oh, my goodness. I meet him in person. How about that? <laughs> now it's time to bring it around town. Bring it around town. I've had the great good fortune to work with Tom Kenny on many different series, but this show is really Tom Kenny's show. He is SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> My name is Tom Kenny, and for the last uh, dozen years or so, I have been the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants. That's really fascinating. There's a little bit of Tom in the character. You know, there's an innocence and a well-meaning attitude that I think Tom emanates. I think his silliness, the actor's silliness, absolutely is incorporated into the character. He really represents the 10-year-old and all of us who's got a day off from school. He lives in the moment. He's very childlike, and he takes things as they come. He can change into different things. And this, and this, and that, and that, this, and that, this, and that, and that. I like that he always believes the best in people. He'll never see that Squidward's crabby. It just won't ever happen. He just, you know, that's his buddy. It all comes from an honest place. I think one of the most appealing things about SpongeBob is his lack of fear and his lack of negative emotions. And in the world that we live in now, he is a beacon of how to be happy in this world. The flip side of that is that when he does occasionally hit a wall, he just falls apart. And now I've lost the only job I ever wanted! <laughs> his lows are just as precipitous as his highs. SpongeBob throws himself into everything 110%, not because of what reward he's going to glean at the end, but just because he can't help but be that way. From episode to episode, these characters maintain their personalities. Those personalities are winning and appealing, and that really helps to account for the universal popularity of the show. Ah! 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 Ah!